learn, learn the, uh, the word of the Lord, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, special welcome to Marcus Summers. Where's Marcus? He's returned back along with our friends. A lot of friends from Countryside Church, our sending church. We're going to be praying for you guys later today during the worship service, so we're glad to have you with us. Uh, today, we're studying the book of Malachi. We're finishing our series of uh, a survey through the books of the Old Testament. So before we dive in, let's go to the Lord and ask him to bless our time together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, first of all, for a church building to worship in. Thank you for brothers and sisters willing to take an extra um, bit of time, a little bit of a sacrifice to be here to learn more about uh, the prophet Malachi. Lord, I just ask that you would bless this lesson today. Uh, may it please you. May we glorify you uh, as we pick up the book of Malachi. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we began this series of the Old Testament survey nine and a half months ago. It was November 13th, I believe, 2022. I had to look on YouTube. JD introduced the Old Testament. Here we are. What is it? August 27th, 2023. And we're finishing up the Old Testament, this little book of Malachi. And I entitled my lesson. I don't ever entitle my lessons. But this time I thought, I got to title this lesson. It's a misunderstood book that's often overlooked. Hopefully by the end of this lesson, you'll see why I say that. This book has two parts. Number one, the first two chapters is a reprimand. Part two, chapters three and four, is a warning. And you'll see that that warning points to a very important future day of reckoning. So have your Bibles ready. We're gonna go through Malachi. We're gonna read the entire thing today. Okay, I, I told J.D., the Word of God is much more impactful and well-written than anything Scott Huffman or any commentator could possibly come up with, so we're going to have a chance to do it. The book of Malachi, if you look in verse 1 of chapter 1, indicates that Malachi is the author, and what we know is that Malachi comes from a Hebrew word that means my messenger. Obviously, that indicates that Malachi is a prophet speaking the Word of God, but it also refers very fittingly to another messenger that God's going to send at a later date. And we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that future messenger. That's really all we know about Malachi, though. His name means my messenger. Um, we know he's the author. But unlike other prophets, Malachi doesn't tell us who is the political leader of the time. We kind of know from history, but he doesn't say who it is. Malachi doesn't name his father. So we don't know what tribe he comes from. Was he a Levitical priest? We have no idea. He kind of acts like one. But it's interesting uh, that that's all he gives us. And we do know he is the final prophet of the 12 minor prophets. Again, we've said every single time we go through a minor prophet, they're not called minor because of their uh, importance or their contribution, just because they're very short books. Malachi comes in at 1,320 words. It's only 55 verses broken up into four, well, I would almost say three and a quarter chapters. The last chapter is six verses. So that's why we're going to read through it. I want you to hear the words of this prophet in its entirety. And it's only going to take us about 12 minutes. By the way, the 12, I learned, uh, the final 12 prophets, these, these uh, were actually lumped into one book called the 12. It used to be read as one book. So with that... Before we start reading, as per usual, we want to do some important background information. We need to talk about a little bit about the content. Um, so that as we read it, I want it to make a little more sense. There's just a couple things in there, and then we'll read through the book together. So again, have your Bibles ready. All right, so let's do a quick overview. When we come to Malachi, this is post-Babylonian exile, okay? The people had now been back in the homeland for at least 100 years, which means that Malachi's message is to a Jewish people who largely had not even experienced the captivity. Maybe there was a handful of very elderly ancient people who had been there, but certainly by now, most of the people had maybe heard of what happened, but they certainly didn't experience it. And just like their forefathers, and this is key here, this newest generation of Israel was already forgetting the lessons of the past, even the, the near past. You'll see as we read through the text that these Israelites were proving to be just as unfaithful to God as their ancestors. In fact, 
If you look at uh, chapter 3, verse 7, God says through the prophet Malachi, From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Now, in fairness, we have to give them the benefit and say they weren't guilty of rampant uh, idolatry. They weren't worshiping pagan gods. That had been dealt with in uh, the captivity in Babylon. However, and this is key, they had become very lackadaisical. You could say they were lukewarm in their worship. And you'll see that the priests weren't doing what they were supposed to do. They were not committed to teaching or applying uh, the words given to Moses, the scriptures, and so correspondingly, the people had a very casual approach to worship. You're going to see that play out here. So the question I had was, how in the world could this happen? I mean, we're talking uh, maybe two, three generations post-exile. How in the world could they become so lukewarm after God had graciously brought them out of captivity and said, here's the land I promised to your fathers? Well, let me tell you, going back a little bit, we've been studying this past couple months, when the first wave of captives came back, they felt an immense joy, a tremendous sense of community. As they built the temple, they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, there was a sense of hope for the future. Maybe now all of God's promises are going to come to pass. Yet, there were also traces of, of immense sadness that would eventually give way to what we would call diminished expectations. You'll see that here. For example, the prophet Ezra detailed a really prime example of the sadness that was mixed with all the joy and hope. When the temple foundations were laid just a couple of years after that first wave came back from captivity. Here's what Ezra 3.11 says. All the people shouted with a great joy when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men, who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundations of this house being laid. See, they remembered the first temple, the, the first returnees, and they could tell it was nowhere near the size or grandeur of the one Solomon had built. Keep in mind, these people were coming out of captivity. They didn't have a lot of money, so it, it sank in. It's not going to be like the one that Solomon built. That was a huge disappointment to them. There was an, also an awareness that the glories, the earlier glories of the kingdom uh, in the time of uh, King David and King Solomon weren't going to come back anytime soon. They did have Zerubbabel as their leader, which is important because he was a descendant of King David, so he was living proof of the promises of the covenant that God had promised David. That was still in effect. So again, they had some hope. But they also realized that Zerubbabel wasn't ruling over anything close to um, that kingdom that was promised to David's offspring. And it wasn't anything close to the future glorious kingdom that the prophets spoke of. And if you look at the prayers of both Ezra and Nehemiah a little bit later, they were acutely aware that although they were no longer in captivity, they were still subject to foreign powers. They didn't have what they thought they were going to have. So in a nutshell, you could say, these people didn't see any evidence of God's promises coming true. And they begin to wonder, collectively, if maybe God has abandoned them. They begin to doubt. Now, I, would, I, would, I worked through this. I said, oh, they're not atheists. They still believe in God. They're still God's people. But a lot like, if you think about it, their ancestors who had been led out of Egypt, once they encountered difficulty, what did they do? They began to grumble. They began to wallow in self-pity. And so... They didn't really appreciate what God had done for them. They forgot who God was. And again, spiritual apathy became rampant. There was a lack, very importantly, there was a lack of reverence in their worship, a lack of awe, a lack of fear of God. And as you'll see as we read through, the spiritual um, uh, sacrifices were no longer offered out of a love for God or out of a desire to please their God. And this, all of this that I'm giving you as background is the whole reason Malachi was called to speak words to the people on God's behalf. And here you're going to see it. He's going to outline a list of charges against them. He's going to tell them exactly how they have fallen short of the covenant promises their forefathers so long ago had agreed to on Mount Sinai. Do you remember that Mosaic covenant? We've talked about it many times. It was a bilateral conditional covenant. 
God came to Israel. He picked them out of all the nations on the earth and said, it was kind of like a wedding proposal, we said. And, and that's kind of how the prophets depict God picking, choosing his bride. And he said, look, in the Mosaic Covenant, here's what I'm going to do for you. I promise you all these blessings if you'll be obedient and you'll obey me. And Moses reads the words of the covenant to them. Again, bilateral, conditional covenant. And what did the people say back to Moses in Exodus 19? He, they said, and this is important because of where we're at in Malachi here. They said, all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, right? And then we know, and this is also important, that there at Mount Sinai, Moses commanded the Levitical priests, it's your duty to teach all the people, specifically the parents, to teach the law of God, the commands, the obedience to the parents. And you parents are supposed to teach it to your children and to their children's children ad infinitum, uh, uh, all the way down. And very importantly, if you remember the book of Exodus, the whole lesson was take care lest you forget what God had done for you. But that was a long time ago. Here we are at Malachi. It was a long time ago, and they had forgotten. So as we read through it again, you'll see, again, this generation that Malachi is speaking to, they're not living by the promises made by their ancestors. Levitical priests, they're failing to teach, as God had told Moses to uh, direct them to do, to Levi and the offspring. And Malachi, he sees all of this. It's very disturbing to him. In, in chapter 2, verse 10, Malachi asks his fellow Jews, why do we profane the covenant of our fathers? So what you're about to hear is a series of disputes or arguments between God and the people. Every time you'll see Malachi is speaking for God, and he leads the conversation by making either a claim or a direct accusation. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through them really quick in um, paraphrase so that when we get to it, you'll, you'll see and understand them better. This is what Malachi says, the Lord says to him. You have polluted me by offering imperfect sacrifices. You profane my name by disrespecting me in this way. You yawn when I chastise you. Yet you've offered me sick or stolen or blind animals as sacrifices. And you priests, you've abandoned my word. You failed to teach the way Moses commanded you to teach. And by the way, your daughters marry pagans. And then at the end of chapter 2, it looks like Malachi throws in his two cents. Usually he says says the Lord, but Malachi adds in here, you men don't love your wives and divorce seems to be no big deal to you. And you have made God tired because of your complaining that you think he's being unfair. And then God continues through Malachi, you rob me by failing to tithe. You don't even give me what's rightfully due to me and you've spoken against me. These are the charges that Malachi delivers to God's people on God's behalf. And to each of these accusations, guess how the people respond? Humility? Repentance? No. No. In fact, they, they come back with outright uh, questioning or disagreement. God begins, as you'll see, by coming to them and saying, I have loved you. And they have the nerve to ask God, how have you loved us? You can almost imagine, I was thinking about this, it's kind of like an insolent teenager back-talking their parents. And I say that not because Carol and I had five teenagers in our house. I was one of them. <laughs> These people are like immature children as you listen to their responses. They fail to understand that by rebuking them and commanding them to repent, God was in fact demonstrating his patience with them and his love for them. God explains to them, this is something I want to explain. He says, as he says, I've loved you, he talks about loving Jacob, but hating Esau's brother, Esau. And you think, well, why is he talking about that? He tells him he'll forever be angry with Esau and his descendants, that they will never be great because anything they plan or build, God's going to tear it down. And he refers to Edom. Those are the Edomites, the descendants of Esau. But God's telling them he loved Jacob, and they, by extension, are Jacob. They are Jacob's descendants, just so look for that. But they don't understand why he's reprimanding them now. Again, I'm going to paraphrase their response so that when we read it, uh, it'll make better sense. So how have we despised your name? How have we polluted you and, and your table? They actually have the audacity to say back to him, in so many words, 
your accusations are boring us. Again, like an insolent teenager. They say to each other, it is so ridiculous that God would be angry at our offerings. Like he expects these perfect, unblemished sacrifices. What exactly does he want from us? Why does God no longer accept our offerings? And how have we wearied God with our words? Unbelievable. Again, paraphrasing. Again, speaking back to God, they say, how are we supposed to return to you? And how exactly have we spoken against you? And they say to each other, what good does it do to, to obey God? Or to act sorry for disappointing. It's not like it's going to change our circumstances at all. This is their hearts. The key lesson here as we read through this is that the exile, we have to understand, didn't fundamentally change the people. Their hearts were just as hard as everybody that came before them. It kind of brings to mind what Paul said in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's true for them. But God is going to respond, and he will have the last word. So now let's turn to the book of Malachi. It happens to be, again, the last book of the Old Testament, which, for those of you that are new to the Bible, it's right before the book of Malachi. So let's turn there. Everybody's already done it. In particular, I want you to notice something. Listen to the tone of voice God speaks to them with. I would, I would say, maybe you can disagree with me, it's a loving sternness. And you'll notice in those first two chapters, part one, it is a reprimand. As you shift to part two, chapters three and four, uh, you'll notice that God transitions uh, to a warning. Now, mixed within the warning, you'll see promises. It's a wonderful thing about when God speaks warnings to his people. But you'll notice that from reprimand to warning, these two parts. So if you want to turn to verse 1, you'll notice uh, this is the heading that Malachi gives this recording of the oracle, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. And so in verse 2, we begin with Malachi speaking to the people. Read with me. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals in the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down. And they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this. And you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts. To you, O priests, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he show, will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now, entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious with us. With such a gift from your hand, he will show favor. Will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who had shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is its food, may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering? Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. 
For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. And now, O priests, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I've already cursed them because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave it to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you do not keep my ways but show partiality in your instruction. And now it looks like Malachi continues, and it seems like Malachi is going to throw in his two cents here. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem, for Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off the tents of Jacob. Any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts, and he continues, and this is the second thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offerings or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you've been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. The man who does not love his wife, but divorces her, says the Lord. The God of Israel covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. There may be a little bit of a double meaning there if you think about the prophet Hosea who talked about um, Israel being a bride and God being faithful to her. So it's a reminder of that, but a very direct uh, condemnation of their willingness to divorce and to forget the love of their wives. Going on, you have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone does evil, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. He's talking about those who bring these inadequate sacrifices, and the priests say that God is happy with them, just to explain that a little bit. By saying everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Okay, now we shift to part two. We begin the warning. There will still be a couple of reprimands here, some promises. But in large part, part two is the warning. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold... He is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then... The offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord. 
as in the days of old and is in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and who do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Big warning. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. He's reminding them of his love for them as he reprimands and warns them. From the days of your fathers, you've turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the future of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord, but you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What's the profit of our keeping his charge or walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. He's talking about those that are arrogant enough to bring poor sacrifices. And the priests are saying, you're blessed because you brought sacrifices. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. And then, this is interesting, Malachi writes this, Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. And it made me wonder, is it this little book? Is Malachi referring to his own book? We don't know. Could be. But in the midst of all this stern warning, we are seeing evidence of a remnant of faithful. Isn't that interesting? Continuing on in verse 17. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then, once more, you shall see the distinction between the righteousness and the wicked, the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. And then finally this in chapter 4. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. We just read through an entire book of the Bible there. Now, I want to look back at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3 as we finish up here. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare a way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now, at first glance, it might seem that God's talking about sending John the Baptist, Right? to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah, which would make sense because Malachi closes the Old Testament, then we have the intertestament period, 400 years, God's voice goes silent, and then all of a sudden we have the Gospels describing the first return of Christ, right? Also, 
as shown uh, here on the right side of my slide, if you look at Mark chapter 1, he kind of says the same thing. He, he says that Isaiah the prophet, in fact, pretty much said the same thing Malachi did. Here's what John or Mark chapter 1 says. As it is written by Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I will send my messenger before your face who will prepare the way. He was definitively speaking of John the Baptist, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. But notice here that Mark doesn't connect Malachi's words to John the Baptist. And Malachi, shown here on the left, doesn't mention this voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Why? Why doesn't he? Let's look a little more closely at chapters 3 and 4 of Malachi, okay? I want you to specifically look at the penultimate verse of chapter 4, verse 5 of chapter 4. It appears that God is ending this message warning of a promise of something called a future day of the Lord, specifically mentioned here. This is a day spoken of by the psalmist, by Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Boy, if you've read Joel, Joel focuses a lot on this day of the Lord. Amos, Obadiah, Zephaniah, Zechariah. Read Zechariah 14 sometime. According to chapter 4 here in Malachi, this is a day that will bring with it both judgment and blessing. Isn't that interesting? Now, I want to say this as I talk about the day of the Lord. This isn't a topic we study a lot. And it doesn't matter, I want to just lay this out, it doesn't matter what you believe about the timing of the rapture, it doesn't matter whether the day of the Lord is one day that kicks everything off, or it's a period of time beginning on a specific day. Keep in mind what Stephen Parkin taught us when we came to the prophets. He talked about um, something known as telescoping of prophecy. It's really common in the Old Testament for prophets to talk about future events, plural, as if they're one event. It's kind of like when you come from eastern Colorado and you see the mountain range of the Rockies, it looks like one mountain range. But in fact, as you get closer, they're separated by time and distance. And even perhaps this reference of a coming messenger may have an element of that. But keep that in mind, that prophetic events far and near sometimes are treated as one vision. And for the purposes of today's lesson, it doesn't matter whether you see the day of the Lord as one day or a period of time. The important thing is here that Malachi is talking about a future eschatological event, the coming of Christ that has not yet happened, which might surprise you because, you know, typically we don't think of Malachi as an eschatological book. So why do I say this? I want to again, I'll look again back at those first two verses of chapter three. I want to go through this. Again, many would say, this is talking about John the Baptist preparing the way for Christ's first coming, but if you continue reading it, and what we do as Bereans we don't take one verse and interpret the rest of Scripture through it. We look at the context and what the book is saying as a whole and help us interpret the, the, um, the verse in, in uh, question. So if you continue reading, um, notice, for example, in verse 1, the Lord says, uh, the Lord that they seek will suddenly come to his temple. Now, I want to ask you, when Jesus came the first time, was it sudden and he go to the temple? I would say, he grew in his mother's womb for nine months and came quietly to a manger in Bethlehem. The first time he came to the temple was 30 days later, and he didn't come triumphantly, and suddenly his parents led, them, led him there to be dedicated as per the law of God. He came again when he was 12. They brought him back from Bethlehem. They walked, very slowly I would imagine, to the temple for Passover. It wasn't sudden. Verse 2 asks a question that... Uh, I believe it was Joel also asked this question, who can endure the day of his coming? So what does it mean that he'll come suddenly and that many won't be able to survive that day as it seemed to be indicating? We have to ask, is this talking about Jesus' first coming or his second coming? Ask yourselves that. Did Christ's first coming bring with it the death of his enemies? Did people fall down dead when he came? No, don't see evidence of that. We do have a parallel passage in Revelation 6. 15 through 17, that asks the same exact question Malachi asks here. And there's no question that this passage is talking about Christ's second coming. Listen to the words of Revelation 6, which describes the day when Christ returns in glory to defeat his enemies. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slaved and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's Jesus. 
For the great day of their wrath, speaking of these earthly rulers, the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Go to verse 4 of Malachi. It gives us a little more insight here. It says, then, again, meaning at that point when Christ returns, then the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Now, this can't be talking about when Jesus came the first time. They were still offering sacrifices, weren't they? Were those pleasing and sufficient to the Lord? No. Christ going to the cross was the only pleasing, sufficient sacrifice. This has to be future. Verse 5, then, again, speaking of that day, I will draw near to you in judgment. Did Christ appear in judgment the first time? I don't think so. Verse 12, look at verse 12, chapter 3. It says, then, again, pointing to that day when he returns, all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight. And that's certainly not been fulfilled. Were the Israelites or the Jews at the time considered blessed by all the nations? Oh, they hated them. Just like today, most of the nations hate Israel. So this has to be future. Now I want to look at the end of the book again, chapter 4, verse 5. One more little thing here that I want to deal with. Chapter 4, verse 5. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And I don't think that we can say this was John the Baptist, that, that, that John was Elijah, as some have suggested, because guess what? John told us he wasn't Elijah. John 1.21, you know, John the Baptist was out doing his thing, and the, the people came to him, and they asked him point blank, what then, are you Elijah? They were very aware of what both Isaiah, and obviously what Malachi had said, and they wanted to know, are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? What did John the Baptist say to them? No, I am not. Furthermore, in Luke chapter 9, if you think back a few weeks ago, J.D. was teaching us through uh, the transfiguration on the mount of, of uh, where he was transfigured. Uh, verse 30 of Luke 9 says, Behold, two men were there talking with him, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Later in verse 33, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So clearly, Jesus wasn't Elijah if, in fact, Peter could accurately count to three. Uh, furthermore, I don't think anyone refers to what happened in the manger in Bethlehem as a great and awesome day of the Lord. Nor do the scriptures refer to his triumphant return to Bethlehem on a donkey as a great and awesome day of the Lord. Uh, his crucifixion wasn't referred to in scripture as a great and awesome day of the Lord. And as wonderful and awesome as the resurrection was, the basis of our faith, scripture doesn't refer to that as a great and awesome day of the Lord. So it seems to me, and you can disagree with me, it seems we're left with only one option. God, through Malachi, is speaking of a yet future day. So again, it would be nice to say, and I wanted to say this because I always thought this, Malachi is the final book of the Old Testament foretold of the coming of Christ. And it does. But again, it seems very clear to me that as God is promising immense blessings to those who fear his name, he's also giving a very clear warning to those who do not fear his name of Christ's ultimate return to earth. And that's how Malachi ends. God's voice, like I said, it goes silent for over 400 years until the angel Gabriel comes with the word of God to another man named Zechariah, not the prophet, and he tells him your wife's going to be pregnant and he'll give birth to a son. That's John the Baptist. But I want you to think for a moment how the Old Testament ends as we put a bow on our study here. Again, we think of Malachi, I always thought of Malachi, anyway, as this nice little prophecy that foretells Jesus is coming and then he comes, of course, and we say, isn't that nice? Malachi foretold of Jesus. And then we kind of move on. We get it, right? But this is why I call Malachi a misunderstood book that's often overlooked. And I want to say this. The, the, the warning bell that Malachi rang then is still ringing in the air today. This is why we still study the Old Testament. It's the same exact bell that Zechariah rang in chapter 14 of his prophecy. Be ready because Christ is coming again. And this time, guess what? He's not coming on a donkey. He's coming on a white horse. And he'll be clothed in a robe dipped in, dipped in blood. 
And on his robe and on his thigh, his name is written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. When he comes again, it'll be a wonderful day of blessing for those who fear him. But for those who don't, it'll be a day of dread as he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Malachi is speaking the exact same message to us today that was delivered to the Israelites of his day. Just like them, we need to be reminded of how everything we have comes from him, don't we? I like to grumble. I forget how blessed I am. Just like them, we need to be reminded of how important it is to have a healthy fear of the Lord because he is coming back in power and in glory on a future day of reckoning. And let me say this, it doesn't matter if you believe that it's a signless return or that there are, it doesn't matter because for you and me, guess what? This ought to be of high priority because for you and me, we don't know when our end will be. For you or me, we may meet Jesus tonight or tomorrow. God knows the day of your death. When is it? Do you know? There should be a sense of urgency as we think about Christ's second coming. Doesn't matter what precedes us because we don't know when we're going to go. Just like them, we need to be ever diligent to preserve a high view of our Creator and Savior, and that our love for Him is to be reflected in reverent worship. Just why I'm so grateful for this church and what JD and Stephen lead us in. I'm so thankful. I want to say this also, uh, the New Testament authors also saw Christ as the coming judge. I'll quote from James, he said, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And that's exactly where the Old Testament leaves us. So, guess where we're going next in our series? I'll leave that for you to figure out. New Testament. We're dismissed for now, but I ask you to come back here uh, at 1030, and we will reverently and prayerfully worship this awesome God. Thank you, and you're dismissed.